Welcome to the Natus Neurocom Medical Professional eSeminar Series. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Diane Risley, who will discuss the use of vibrotactile feedback and SOT in the management of falls in older adults. Dr. Risley is an Associate Professor and Director of Post-Professional Programs in the Department of Physical Therapy at Wingate University. Dr. Risley received her Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy from the University at Buffalo, a Master of Science from Old Dominion University, and a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Oregon Health and Sciences University. She has published numerous articles and has presented at national and international conferences on the evaluation and treatment of patients with vestibular and balance dysfunction. Her research includes the use of sensory information for balance and novel techniques in the evaluation and treatment of vestibular and balance dysfunction. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Risley. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to present this this morning. Um, I'm really excited to present some of the research I've been doing over the last 10 years and how it can relate to fall prevention. So during this presentation, we're going to talk about some different vibrotactile feedback devices and how it's been used so far in fall risk reduction. We're going to talk a little bit about the SOT and how we can identify fall risk and also do fall risk reduction, as well as how we can integrate the two devices. So falls are a huge concern, and we hear this a lot about the elderly, but it's also in patients with other different pathologies. And so at least a third of adults over the age of 65 years fall each year but this is interesting because if you talk to young adults and how many of them fall, about a third of young adults fall each year as well. And what really differs is the conditions under which they fall and the consequences of the falls. And this rate of falls does increase in adults over the age of 75 years and in adults with cognitive impairments or dementia. And so falls are a serious issue we need to deal with. Um, <clears throat> falls are the major reason for long-term care admissions. They're associated with significant decline in function and increased mortality and morbidity. And there's a lot of negative consequences of falls, including fear of falling that just leads to more decreased activity and so more risk of falling. Anxiety, which again leads to decrease in activity and more falling, a loss of self-confidence to ambulate, and self-imposed functional limitations. Now, all of this is really important, and we all really know that there's a problem with falls in many different populations. Falling is really multifactorial. It is not just one condition. Um, and so with falls, we have lower extremity weakness, and sensory deficits contributing to falls. And this is not as simple as just one muscle group. This tends to be a lot of different muscle groups, and it may be more complex than just weakness. It probably has to do with motor control, timing, sequencing of muscle activity, in addition to just pure weakness. Balance disorders also contribute to falls, and this is a huge category. When I think about balance, I think about both sensory and motor components of balance. And it's both these sensory and these motor components that are a problem with falls. And this is where our vibrotactile devices can help fit in because they can help with the sensory aspects. And so with um, with sensory aspects of balance, we're going to talk in a little bit about what that involves um, as far as the different senses that contribute to balance, how we weight them, how we coordinate them. We also see cognitive impairments contributing to falls, and this is where that increased fall rate in people with dementia. And cognitive impairments create a problem because they're more difficult to treat. 
And again, some of these vibrotactile devices may be helpful in people with cognitive impairments because they provide a sensory substitution without making someone have to think about what they're using. The brain can just use this information. Visual deficits are a huge contributor to falls. And this is not just as simple as having um, a loss of sight. It may be visual contrast sensitivity. It may be problems with saccade, smooth pursuit, other aspects of vision, so that people aren't seeing the visual environment well. Again, we can use the vibrotactile devices to help um, give a different sense to help overcome some of these visual deficits. Medications are a huge risk towards fall. And then environmental factors also contribute strongly to falls. And so some of them we're not going to address with vibrotactile feedback, but some of these others we can actually contribute um, to them and help defray some of the problems. So when we think about balance, as I said, I think about it as sensory and motor. And when I'm teaching my students, I'm really very strict about this, that I don't like them just saying someone has a balance impairment, because that doesn't tell us really what's going on and doesn't tell us how to treat. But we use primarily three senses to balance. We use vision, we use vestibular, and we use somatosensory. And so vision gives us an idea of what's going on in the environment. We develop a relationship and a reference to gravitational, to vertical. So we look at vertical references in the, in the environment to help us know when we're upright. upright. The stibular looks at gravitational vertical as well as tilt translation and, and um, rotational acceleration and can tell us where we are in relationship to gravity. Both vision and vestibular have to be changed from head-centered coordinates to body-centered coordinates. And this is done at the neck. And so when we talk about somatosensory, we're not just talking about the foot and ankle. We're also talking about somatosensory information at the neck that helps transform vision and vestibular information to body-centered coordinates. We're talking about somatosensory at um, all the way down the chain, OK? So from the brain on out. Somatosensory includes our muscle spindles, our joint receptors, the things that tell us how our limbs are, are moving. And we use this information together to come up with a motor output for standing and walking. And this is the ultimate of what we're trying to achieve. And we've all talked about the different balance strategies that are available. And we know that they're used in combination and that we, um, so we don't just use a hip strategy or an ankle strategy. And more likely, they're actually tuned to specific movements and directions of movement of the body rather than just um, using one movement, rather, for anterior, posterior, or medial lateral. Um, and so we have these different motor outputs. Where the vibrotactile devices have come into play is they've come in more as a sensory substitution. So they're substituting here to help improve this output. So what we've seen, and I'll introduce the three main ones I'm going to talk about in a minute, but they can help substitute for vestibular or visual information primarily through giving extra somatosensory input. We know that somatosensory input is really very strong, and it's probably the primary sense that we rely on when all three senses are available. We also know that just getting as much as 100 grams of force through the finger can change the sequence of muscle activity from a distal to proximal sequence to a sequence from the finger on down 
and can significantly decrease sway when the eyes are closed. So somatosensory information is huge and is something our body really likes to depend on. So these devices that give extra somatosensory information are almost like substituting with a cane or something else that gives somatosensory information to help compensate for these other senses. And so therefore it can decrease falls um, and improve balance. So some of the different devices. So this first one is called the brain port. And they've all been out for about the same amount of time. None of them are commercially available really in the United States yet, though they're becoming closer to that. Um, but you can get them in other countries. Um, and they are being used experimentally. So the brain port has an accelerometer and has um, a gyro. And what that does is it determines the body's movement in space. And then this device is put under the tongue and it has a, an electronic or electrode array that gives signals as to how the body is moving in space. It's actually very strong information and has been shown to be helpful just putting on the device will decrease um, balance problems, will imp improve postural stability, as well as training with it on will allow for um, improved balance. And so this is just one of their studies and they've done several studies. There's a lot in the literature. But in this particular study, they looked at both short-term and long-term effects. They had 93 subjects. They did three to five consecutive days of clinic training, and this was several hours a day, followed by home training. So they would actually do different balance exercises with the device on. And then if you look at the chart, these are the different assessments that they did. This is the number of subjects this first part is short-term improvements and then long-term improvements, so two to eight weeks. So for short-term, they had about a 10-point change in the sensory organization test, which is beyond the minimal detectable change, so it is, it is significant. The dynamic gait index, they had a change of 2.4 points which is just below the minimally clinically important difference, but still um, it was statistically significant. For the activity specific balance confidence scale, they had a change of 9.1 points. 10 points is considered clinically significant. And for the dizziness handicap inventory, they had a change of 12.7 points. These were all in people with vestibular dysfunction. Um, this is not as impressive because 18 points is the minimally clinically important difference for the BHI. Long term, they had very similar improvements. And so what this shows is that it's not just wearing the device that improves postural stability, but training with the device on can be an adequate error signal that allows the brain to learn to use other senses for balance, and I think this is part of what's really exciting from a rehab standpoint. Um, because especially with this device, there aren't many people that want to have something under their tongue and walk around with it on. But doing some training with it on is definitely possible and feasible. And so this is this long-term effect here is what's really exciting. And one of the things in the long-term effect, the dynamic gait index actually did get to the minimally clinically important difference. The second device is a vibrotactile vest. Um, also, we used to call it the balance belt. And I've been more intimately involved with this. Um, this was developed by Conrad Wall and colleagues from Massachusetts Eye and Ear um, Infirmary. And he has now taken this um, and is taking it commercial. But again, what it has is a gyro and an accelerometer. 
So it's put on the back. This is an older unit that's really large, um, but this detects how the trunk is moving in space. And then it has tactors, vibratory tactors, that are on the trunk. And as the person sways forward, the tactors in the front will turn on. And as they go backwards, the tactors in the back will turn on, and they move up depending on how far the person is moving. So it gives a good information about how the trunk is moving in space. We know that the trunk is really under control of the vestibular system, the head and trunk. The somatosensory system is more in charge of the lower leg um, when we're talking about balance responses. So this is really was developed to be a vestibular um, substitution device. Um, a prosthesis type device. This is a second generation device, a prototype that made it a lot smaller. So as the technology has developed, we've been able to go to a much smaller smaller belt. This is the what's going to commercial it was available commercially. And Dr. Wall has actually displayed this at combined sections meeting for the last couple years. And so what you see here is you've got a central processor and a battery. You have motion sensors, which are the accelerometer and the gyros, um, up front that detects the trunk motion. And then you have vibrators, the vibrotactors, and they all, they've limited to four now. They started with a 16 array model and they've gone and brought it down to four to give the adequate amount of information. Um, and so this belt is now much lighter, able to be worn under clothing, and can be a lot more um, aesthetically pleasing. So we did some research at the University of Buffalo on this belt. <clears throat> and what we found was really exciting to us. Because we had the people, and these were older adults with balance problems that came in to see us. And we had about 12 people come in, and we tested them with a couple different gait tests, the functional gait assessment, the dynamic gait index, and then just straight gait analysis with the device on but not turned on. And then we turned the device on and measured them again. And this is that first generation device. Very awkward, nothing that anybody would want to wear out in public, but it was the first concept. And what we found is this is the, um, the tilt. This is actually measured by the device. And this is somebody without the device on. And you can see how much they actually had sway. And this is just their sway in the rolled plane. And this is one place where they actually lost their balance. With the device turned on, that's much smoother. And so they're actually able to stabilize their walk. And I don't have this um, video working today, but it's amazing the difference that this device made just putting it on and doing a very short, about 10-minute training with these people. The other thing we noticed with this is in the dynamic gait index, they increase just by putting on the device, they increase their scores by over three points. So they went from being at fall risk with a score of about 17 to being at decreased fall risk with a score of about 21. And this is clinically significant, this change of three points. Um, this is something we would typically see after somebody would do therapy for a while. And so this was really exciting to us that we could take the device put it on somebody at risk for falls, and immediately decrease the risk of falls with this device. And that's what all of these inventors are trying to get at, is do we have something that we can put on patients in the hospital, in the community, that can immediately decrease their fall risk before we can even put in training into place? Because one of the things that we know is that there are real mixed results in fall prevention training. Some of it is really successful and some of it's not as successful. 
this is a graph of um, of the different items in the dynamic gate index and how which ones actually we showed change with using the device. And we saw the greatest amount of change with gait with horizontal head turns. People would walk straighter with the device on than with it off. It also helped, and this surprised me, with stepping over an obstacle. So it allowed them to stabilize themselves as they went to step. And then it helped with gait with vertical head turns, gait with pivot turns, um, level surfaces around an obstacle. Change in gait speed wasn't as much, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide because that was very interesting. Um, this slide is of tilt, so how much tilt the person had um, as they were walking. And we did eyes open, eyes closed, eyes open with a narrow base of support, and eyes closed with a narrow base of support. And what we found is that their amount of trunk tilt in each of these device, each of these conditions decreased when the device was on. And so people were much more stable with the device on. And then we looked at velocity and double support during it, these same ambulation tasks. And so this is velocity. This is eyes open normal, eyes closed normal, eyes open narrow, eyes closed narrow. This is with the device off and this is with it on. One thing that you see is that with eyes open normal and the device on, they slowed down. And remember, these people had only had a few minutes to train with it. And so our thought is, is that during this condition, they are actually were trying to figure out how to use the information. And so they slowed down. They also slowed down eyes closed normal and eyes open narrow. But when they got to a condition that was really difficult to do with eyes closed narrow, they then sped up. They were then able to use the information and they sped up. And they sped up significantly. And so in the conditions in which they really needed to use the device, they were able to do it and perform better. And we see the same kind of trend with percent double support. And so that they actually increased double support during the easier task, but when they got to the eyes closed narrow, it decreased significantly again, probably because then they were able to tap in and use it. And so that's probably why we didn't see speed change as much on a dynamic gait index, is because under normal gait circumstances, when someone first puts on this device, they do slow down their gait a little bit. Um, but over time, they will increase it. So then we, so we had pretty much shown that this can improve postural stability when you first put on the device. But me being a physical therapist saw the great possibility of doing training with this device. And if we can give people an indication of where they are in space and how they're moving, then we can help them learn to use other senses to help keep them upright. And so I wanted to see what happened if we do rehabilitation. So this first, this next study was done at Oregon Health and Sciences University in Dr. Faye Horak's lab, um, where I did my postdoctoral fellowship. And what we have here, we brought people in with bilateral vestibular dysfunction. And we, put the device on them, um, and then we put them on a platform. And we did um, rotation, ramp rotations with these folks and looked at the amount of trunk tilt during the rotation. So we put the device on and we did pre-training assessment. Then we did block training where we did just blocks of different um, velocities of ramp rotations, and then we did um, random training, and then we tested post to see what kind of retention there would be. And what we found was, and again, this is someone with bilateral vestibular loss, and so we would expect a fall or a lot of tilt during ramp rotations, and this was at 
2, 4, and 8 degrees per second, so the more difficult velocities for people with vestibular dysfunction. And what we found was that um, pre, we had a, quite a bit of trunk tilt. With blocked training, it decreased, but there was still a little bit all over, but it decreased. And then we went to random and it decreased. But once we took the stimulation off and we did post, they stayed with less trunk tilt. And so we actually showed an immediate retention of this balance training using the belt. And so this was significant. So we showed the immediate improvement. We wondered what would happen if we did longer training and then tested um, to see if it retained. And so this is another experiment from the University at Buffalo. And what we did is these were, we just had three subjects for this. This was a pilot study. And we had three subjects, um, one, one with peripheral neuropathy, um, and then two with bilateral vestibular loss, who came in and we did pre-testing without the device on, and then they trained for four weeks doing different balance exercises with the belt on, and then we did post-testing. And this is their dynamic gait index score, this is the functional gait assessment score. All, and these were very, subjects with very chronic lesions. And so they had gone through vestibular rehab previously. They were the best that they could be. They were doing their home programs and we wanted to see if we could make them even better. And what we found, and these were people who had participated in other studies in my lab. And so it wasn't that they were on a, um, unfamiliar with these different assessments. They had been through them previously. And so what we saw is all three subjects improved on their dynamic gait index and their functional gait assessment scores with the dynamic gait index really feeling out on the, on the uh, assessment, so getting up to almost perfect scores. The um, functional gait assessment does not have quite the same feeling effect, but you can see they had significant improvements in their scores on these gait assessments. Um, and this was a one week, they were tested one week after they finished training. Um, <clears throat> they also improved in their gait speed, so not as much with eyes open as they did with eyes closed. And this is significant, especially for the people with bilateral vestibular loss, that they now were confident in their ability to walk. And then their timed up and go scores improved as well. One of the things that was really meant a lot to me with this is one of the patients with bilateral vestibular loss used to complain of a very strange lightheaded feeling, especially when he was out in the grocery store. And by doing this four weeks of training, that decreased and he felt much more confident in being able to be out and participate. So it was very exciting. Um, but what this showed us, and we need to do more studies with this, is that this, these devices have a role in rehab. They're not just devices to be sold to patients to be worn out in the community. They may actually allow us to train someone better that can function better even once the device is taken off. And so right now, the belt is um, being developed and is being sold more to be put on someone to go out in the community, but they are talking about building another belt that will have um, adjustability by the therapist so that the therapist can adjust what the parameters are and be able to work with the patient on the parameters. It's very exciting. The third device I wanted to talk about today is the vibrotactile sock. And this was developed by Lars Odson um, when he was in Boston at Boston University. He's now in Minnesota and has developed a company that is commercially making this. We, um, we did research on this at the University of Buffalo as well. And then last fall, we actually took the device to China because there's a Chinese company that may be interested in manufacturing it, and we tried it on patients in China. So 
<laughs> that was very exciting. What the vibrotactile sock or the Wacusin is, and the Wacusin is its manufactured name, is a insole, and it's a disposable insole, but it's an insole with sensors on it that then sends information up into a calf strap, <coughs> um, or it used to be a full calf strap, it's now um, on the lower leg, that has vibrotactors in it. And so it detects center of pressure and then gives that information to the person using the vibrotactors. Um, again, it's, um, it's very strong information. Obviously, the person has to have sensory, sensory, sensory ability in this area in order to wear the device. But it gives signals in the front as the person swaying forward, in the back as they're swaying back, and then to the two sides. This one has both a gait and a standing mode. And so in standing, the four tactors work separate. And so you get forward, backward, side to side. In gait, it'll give signals in the back as you do heel strike, in the front as you do toe off, and then to the sides, um, depending on how, what your medial lateral stability is. Um, and so this one is a little different in that it will do both gait and stance um, and does it differently. This is just a little clip, and I'm going to play it, and I'm hoping people can hear the audio. I'm not going to play the whole clip because it's more on the business aspect of the walk -us in but I want you to see Dr. Odson fitting the patient with the device. It doesn't show the patient using the device, but at least you can see um, what it looks like when he goes to fit it. Okay, I'm going to stop that there, but you can see him sitting the Wacusin on the patient. Um, we're, we proposed, this device was originally developed more for people with peripheral neuropathy, but then we found that it also helped people with different neurologic dysfunction, and so we proposed trying it with them as well. So the person you saw there had had a stroke and used the device with, with success. Now I'm going to show you a video. We did very similar research with the Wacusin in Buffalo as we did with the belt. And so what we did is we got, brought in a group of people, and some of them were the same, that used both the belt and the sock um, and the Wacusin. And we, again, we put the device on. We tested them without the stimulation on. We trained them for a very short period of time. We tested them with the stimulation on. And then with the sock, we actually were able to test them with it off as well. And so this is a woman who um, believe has vestibular deficits. And what you're going to see is her walking with her eyes closed. And the first thing, oops, the first thing you're going to see is her walking without, with the belt, the socks on, but without the stimulation turned on. And you can see she's very unsure of where she's walking, um, very unstable. And she also has a lot of ear. Now the socks are turned on. What's amazing is she's walking faster, much more secure, and goes straight forward, and I almost let her run into the wall. And now the device has been turned back off. Yeah. 
And again, she's unstable, unsure of where she's going, and has a lot of fear. And so with this device, obviously with this trial, we didn't see the retention with just one trial. Um, but she, it definitely is a very big improvement with the device on. So when we looked at the dynamic gait index, um, and I guess I just assume people knew what the dynamic gait index is. It's a clinical assessment of gait balance that has eight tasks. Um, what we found, again, was just like with the belt, we saw a significant increase in scores with the device on, enough that it brought us over the threshold of that 19 points that are indicate increased or decreased risk of fall. And again, it's an improvement that we typically see after weeks of PT. And Dr. Odson developed this graph um, to show changes in the dynamic gait index score with different interventions. These are from other studies. And so in this study, there were 72 treatments of Tai Chi improved dynamic gait index scores about three points. In this one study, they increased about four points, but were 80 treatments of PT. In this one, again, about two with 60 treatments of PT. But in one treatment with the Wacosin, we were able to improve the score about three points. And so it really does compare to multiple sessions of intervention. We also did the functional gait assessment and again showed the same thing. This is on, this is with the stimulation turned off before we tried it, the stimulation on, and then the stimulation off. And what you see here is that increase with the stimulation on, only with the functional gait assessment, we did see a decrease in the scores after the device was on, but they stayed up. They didn't go all the way down. So there is some retention there as well. And then again, we looked at trunk tilt during gait, just like we did with the, function, with the, the belt, the vibrotactile belt and saw the decrease in trunk tilt um, throughout the different gait parameters. We did eyes open, eyes closed, eyes open, narrow base of support, and eyes closed, narrow base of support. <clears throat> um, we also saw very similar improvements in gait um, as we did with the belt, with the sock, or with the Wacosin. Because we had different types of patients trying the, um, the devices, we could compare how they did if they participated in both studies. And so we had six subjects participate in both studies. And there is some prefer preferential improvement with the device that replaces the compromised sense. So people with bilateral vestibular loss improved more with the belt. People with peripheral neuropathy improved more with the Wacosin. We had one subject with orthopedic impairment improve more with the Wacosin, and one with multifactorial dysfunction improve more with the belt. So it really does depend on the sense. And so even though all of these are going to market, patients may do better with one more than the other. Because we saw so much improvement with peripheral neuropathy with the Wacosin, we've been trying it with people with neurologic dysfunction but we're, again, going to focus more on peripheral neuropathy in our research that's coming up um, because that seems to probably be the area where it's going to help the most. We're also looking at being able to change where that cuff pad goes so that it can go further up the leg if there's more sensory loss. So with the sensory organization test, so all of these devices really have a role in improving postural stability, decreasing fall risk, and you can see how they decrease fall risk in just one try, um, but they're not for fall prediction. The sensory organization test has been used for fall prediction some, not nearly as much as I keep thinking it should be, um, but several studies have looked at what might what aspects of the sensory organization test might contribute to fall risk. And so 
So Whitney and her group found that a composite score of less than 38 on the SOT was associated with a risk for falls in people with vestibular dysfunction. Another group looked at people who were kind of middle-aged and looked at occupational falls. And I thought this was really interesting. And they found that patients were at risk for falls if their composite score is greater than 15 points below the norm for their age. But again, this is occupational falls. This wasn't older adults. In the one study that's looked at older adults, they found that older adults with a history of falls, even just more than one fall, had worse scores in condition two and in the use of somatosensory information for balance than those without a history of falls. Um, however, when they looked at odds ratios, they were not statistically significant. And so there's probably something in there, but the ability to actually take their scores and say this is what means fall risk is not there. But it does mean that people with older adults with a history of fall need to have training in the use of somatosensory information for balance to decrease their fall risk. And then older adults with a history of multiple falls, and this was lots of falls, have lower composite scores. And this was a statistically significant odds ratio of 0.94 and scores on condition six. And so people who are falling a lot have an overall lower score on their SOT and scores on condition six, meaning that they're having more visual dependence and difficulty with visual flow information, which has been shown in the literature before as well. So how can we improve, improve balance? And with use of sensory substitution devices in rehab, there's two different ways I can see that we use this. One is the actual um, distribution of the substitution devices to be worn whenever the person is up. And so we can instruct them in the use of the device. It'll take about 20 to 60 minutes to train. We can make sure the parameters are set correctly. We can make sure they understand why they need to use it. Dr. Austin's proposed even using this in the ho inpatient hospitals to decrease fall risk in hospitals. But this is using the device all the time. And then I can see this from those other studies where we showed retention, that it can be used as a rehabilitation device. So the sensory information from the device can act as an adequate error signal. And what I mean by that, it can give the brain the information it needs to know that it's losing its balance and allow the brain to learn to use other intact sensation and develop the appropriate motor skills to maintain postural stability. And because we've seen that subjects improve their performance even after the device is removed. And for a lot of our patients, they don't want to use a device forever because the devices, even though they've gone through several generations, are still bulky. Um, probably the Wacoson is the less bulky and the less invasive of the three. But they, um, people want to work away from their devices. And I think these devices lend themselves to that possibility with certain patients. And then I think when we think of the SOT or the um, Equitest, the Smart Equitest, the Smart Balance Master, there's a lot of things we can do on there for fall prevention. And unfortunately, we don't have good studies that have looked at fall prevention using these devices. But if we think about that somebody needs to be able to use different sensory improvements information and then create the adequate, the appropriate motor responses, the SMART Balance Master, the SMART Equitest, and the, balance, the Neurocom equipment is really, can be beneficial in this. And so I like to use custom targets and then change. I will test limits of stability, determine where somebody is, and then use custom targets to test to be able to train within their appropriate range of limits of stability, altering the different sensory um, inputs. 
And so that's much more than what we can go through today on how to do that, but it makes sense that it would improve. And based on the previous research I talked about, especially trying to get people to use somatosensory information for balance is important. And what I've noticed clinically is that patients who are at risk of falls often will fall on condition four where we take away somatosensory information for balance because they're almost too overly dependent on somatosensory as well. And so that's an issue and we need to be able to alter the sensory inputs. Now, how can we use them in conjunction with the sensory substitution devices? And that's, um, that's kind of the million dollar question. We haven't had a chance to play with this yet, but these devices can give us a another way for the brain to know where they are in space, the person is in space. And so I can envision taking the walkasins and having a patient wear the walkasins to give them that center of pressure information while they're doing the different tasks on the Smart Balance Master and while I'm doing custom training. And instead of just training on a firm surface, training on a foam pad, it gives me a lot more flexibility of what to do. And so I really think we can increase this adequate error signal. It also, if I'm sending somebody home with the device, training it on the Neurocom equipment is also going to allow me to more specifically train what I want that person to do and learn how to use the device. And so I think this is another area that we're going to see growth in over the next few years. 